Welcome to Salon Talks, I'm Mary Elizabeth Williams, and it's always a fun day when we get to welcome an icon, and today oh. is one of those days. You know it, you know it's true. Over 20 years after first introducing us to her iconic world of friendship, love, and of course high heels, Candace Bushnell is back. And we couldn't help but wonder, is there still Sex in the City. The ninth, is it ninth? Did I get this right? Book? Yes. Okay. Yes. From the New York Times bestselling author, television producer takes the cosmopolitan drinking generation through the new challenges and rewards of what she calls middle-aged madness, or as our bartenders now call us, ma'am. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, it is, a, it is a day of reckoning the first time you hear that from across the bar. It is. It is. I. But, you know, I think I first heard that in my when I was in my early 40s and so that's always a shocker but it is a but it is a real play on you know middle-aged madness and, and ma'am. And also the, the mamming of a of a lady. Exactly sure. and it's something that I suppose we should feel proud when someone says oh all right ma'am you know but there's always something that's slightly denigrating about it. Even I don't though, know why. Even, even though you don't want to be Miss anymore. You know you're no. not Miss. You know you're out of your Miss years. And you, yes. You've earned being out of them. But there must be something else, right? I don't know. Your Majesty? Like, what would be better, Candace? What would make us feel well, more like, I am seen, I am, a, yeah. I am not a, a Miss anymore, and yet, and yet well, I, I am. I know. I, know. I, well, I was thinking of the of the letters PM for post-menopausal, I mean, the whole menopause thing, it's like, I need a map to identify where I am on this, you know, it's very simple, really, but um, uh, prime ministers I like of that. their own lives. Oh, I like that. Yes, I it's like women that. who are... They're, they're PMs, they're prime ministers of their own lives. I love, I love that, Candace. Well, you've got a lot of, a lot of these kinds of great, clever catchphrases in this book. I mean, it wouldn't be a Candace Bushnell book without a whole lexicon of its own. So I want to ask you, I was thinking one of the things I wanted to do today was just if we can go through some of the vocabulary that we need to get us through this different phase in our lives. And I want to start with Cubs and catnip. Exactly. Ta ta because we all need to, I think a lot of ladies out here need to know about the cubs and about the catnip. Yes, well, cubs are, uh, cubs are young men who are on the prowl for older women. And, and the women who they're on the prowl for, I mean, usually the younger man, older women relationship. The woman is called a cougar. And it's very predatory. And it's predatory, and she's after these guys. And this is really the opposite. I mean, these are, I mean, they're nice women, you know, I mean, as I say, from the suburbs. I mean, they could be from anywhere. You know, they've had kids. They might even have kids who are in their late teens. And... They find themselves divorced, and really, what the first group of men who start hitting on you are often younger guys, and they grew up in a different time, so they don't have that taboo of, oh, you know, older. They don't feel like older women, quote, older women are unattractive. You know, they grew up with this idea that they are they are attractive. Meanwhile, what happens if when you're in your fifties and you find yourself single? the men your age are not attracted to you because they think you're too old. So you're caught where, you know, the, the men your age aren't attracted to you and the ones who are are like an <laughs> inappropriate generation in a sense. <laughs> and right, and this is the, and this is the conundrum. It's the conundrum. That you describe about going for a lot of women, going on Tinder for the first time, right? Go, like going like after years out there in the safely ensconced in their relationships and going online and realizing that oh I'm not having any matches because I'm looking at men my own age and exactly. then when I change the yes parameters I, a little yes and that was what happened to me I went on Tinder and and it, well Tinder automatically it knows everything about you I mean you can lie on Tinder but 
Tinder knows your real age because they've gotten it somewhere in this morass of information about you. But it decided that my age range was, I think, my age and maybe up to 65. Now, what's interesting is in a lot of these algorithms, the age does not go above 65. For instance, if I go on Instagram and I want to target people who are over 65, I can't. Because they don't exist. They're cut off. They don't exist. You know, they don't exist. They're cut off. Um, and it's, it's a strangely kind of reverse sexist world out there. You know, things have, things have changed quite a bit since I wrote Sex in the City when I was in my mid-30s. Yeah, and this is, uh, one of the things I really appreciate about this book is that you go there with that, that this is not, this is not just Sex in the City all over again, and this is not the, you have a lot that's glamorous in this book. Yes. You have a lot that is, is very, a world that many of us don't see, but you also really take on a lot of very serious issues, and you also, it's called Is There Still Sex in the City, and yet a lot of the book, you leave the city, Candace. I want to yes, talk about this. Exactly. You, the iconic, like you really are in so many ways the quintessential New York City woman. You represent mm -hmm. New York City to generations now of women. And you left the city. You of all people, Candace. Yes. Well, I guess, I mean, part of that is because. You know, I'm always Candace Bushnell first, and I grew up in the country. I grew up in Connecticut, and I grew up riding horses, so it's like, that's in my blood. I know, I've seen the Carrie Diaries. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, know um, I know your origin story. But I think what happened to me is there are things that happen to you, like, psychically. It's part of nature, and it's, you know... I, in a way, it's part of it's a part of getting older, and I really felt compelled to leave the city. And it's also something that it seems to happen to other people as well at a certain point. Interestingly, people go back, but it's it's like all of a sudden everything becomes too much. And for me, I just I. I heard everybody else's voice and I couldn't hear my own voice anymore. And I just, I had to take a break. And I feel really lucky and happy that I was able to kind of take a break. Um, you and, still love New York. But You're yes. You're still a New Yorker. But then the, the problem is you can't, I, you can never really leave New York. And so I, I just, and I've done this a couple of times in the past. I've had to take a break from New York for like six months. Um, I think once I took a break for maybe a year. But, you know, then you've got to figure out like how to get back. Mm -hmm. The island because keeps calling. <laughs> it does. It keeps it does. calling. And the fact is that, if, you know, things can happen to you. So many interesting things can happen to you in Manhattan in, you know, in a day that just don't happen other other places. No, and I mean to say New York City, I don't want to just say it's Manhattan, but it is, you know, everybody's doing things, everyone's I trying. Heard, I heard someone recently uh, say that the thing about New York is it's fun hell. Yes, and I've, exactly. I've never heard it described better, right? Like that's what it is. It's just fun hell. Exactly. And if you, like, if you can roll with that, it's great, but it's still hell, right? It is. It's, 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 there are things, it's physically difficult to live here. I mean, it's the noise. I'm making a little video about getting here. I basically had to go through a construction site and mud puddles and, and then climb know, up. Climb like, up. We didn't stairs. make it easy for you to get here. You had to go through a lot of it. It's not like, oh, you, but just, it's like, you just pull up in, the car, in your car and then we usher you into a stu No, it's not yeah, like but that. But this is New York, though. Yeah. That is New York. That's the way it really is. Well, it's kind of like when people say, and, like, oh, you know, but how much your apartment costs here? But you could live in Madison, Wisconsin for like, you know, one sixteenth of that. And it's like, I know, but th that's not New York City. That's why. We live here. Exactly. It's because it's New York City. But it's still crazy. But you liked, but you really also did love living away from the city and you had all these, ex you, like you, you know write what? about 
bike riding and yes. like being by the water and having your dogs running around and that sounds really nice. It, it, it was, it was really nice and I guess it was, I, I just felt, I, you know, again, I just felt like I really needed to take a break. I felt, was just feeling so stressed and, and I, I think that this is something that happens to a lot of people as we get older and as you get into your 40s and early 50s, you just feel so stressed by trying, you feel like you're taking on everything and doing everything. And, you know, at some point it's just too much. It absolutely, yeah, no, right there with you. <laughs> it's just, it, and you talk about how it's different than it was in our parents' generation yes. when you would hit a certain point in life and you would organically start to be slowing down and playing golf and spending more time with your friends. And instead, you really look head on at now we are, we are becoming generations of men and women who reach a certain age and the walls start coming down on us. Depre yes. And you go like divorce, depression, depression, job losses, serious medical issues. Like it is not the it is not the golden girls years, right? That we maybe had thought we were going to get. Yes, exactly. Or I mean I I you know, I think one of the realities is when you're young, you don't think about what your life is going to look like after 50 because we're so programmed to, you know, kind of stop at that demographic. But the reality is it's a group of people, it's becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger demographic, people over 50. And it's, people are going to be living for another 30, maybe even 40 years. So it actually is a whole nother section of your life. I mean, you could look at it, it's the equivalent of your life from 30 to 50, and we know how much happens in that time of like from 30 to 50. I mean, that's when you can go from, you're, you know, you're starting to realize your dreams and you do, you know, it's a time when you do realize, you know, your hopes and things about your career and, family and that sort of thing, but it doesn't just fade away into the sunset. And right. so there's now this whole chunk of time where, you know, really one, you've got to, you know, find meaning and find your meaning in it because society doesn't assign you any meaning for that time of your life other than, oh, you could be a great grandparent and aren't you happy to be a grandparent? Well, right. I mean, it's, it's like I'm not done yet. Yes, I'm happy to be a grandparent, but I got a lot of other things to it's do. It's not even 50. It's like 40. Like, like so mm -hmm. many, so much, so much of the um, demographics that we see, or the way that things are marketed, it's like it's like 18 to 25, and 25 to 30, and then it's 40 plus. As if yes. being 41 is the same as being 80. It's just all this one big amorphous lump of, well, you're over 40. Exactly. <laughs> you're all the same. Exactly. And meanwhile, it's people are living longer. And as you say, it's like they're getting divorced. They have to figure out how to date again. They have to figure out how to, how to very often shift careers. Yes. And, and you know, often they, you kind of have to figure out how to survive again. Um, you know, there can be a lot of downsizing. And you were hit with all of that, and you were very honest about that. Yes, and, and you, know, there's, you, you know, there's a lot of reinvention, but the great thing about it, I find, is that it's also a time, I mean, when I was in my 50s, it was, I mean, that was definitely a passage where I did feel bad, I mean, you know, when I wrote the book, while I was writing the book, my father actually did die, and one of my best friends killed herself. So I was really trying to hold it together. And, but I think that's, that makes the book legitimate because these things happen to everybody, and, and nobody talks about it. Right, and you, you very, I mean, you, you look at the cover of this book and it's you, very glamorous, high heels on right. the sofa, it, and, and it is a glamorous book, and I want to talk about the glamorous parts of it as well, but you open it with 
death. Mm -hmm. You first chapter right off the bat, your dog dies in front of you. You have the death of your father. You end the book with this other death that comes out of nowhere that is very shocking and, mm -hmm. and upsetting. That is clearly the way that you bookend it within this very glamorous, beautiful package feels very strategic. Right. You're 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 going to bring us into this story that's a little darker and harder than maybe we would have expected from you. Well, I, I think that people have this perception that somehow my books are light and fluffy, and they're not. I mean, all of them are dark, and I mean, Four Blondes is really dark, Trading Up is really dark, but what happens over time as a writer, as you become more commercial, they clip, clip, clip that darkness back, because readers don't want it, or there's a belief that readers don't want it. You know, they, readers don't want things to be too dark. And to that point, um, you know, I mean, I didn't want it to be about, uh, I didn't want it to be about a, a book about women who, they have problems and they can't get out of them because, you know, that's another reality. And that's the really dark part where it just, would take so much more to explore that but you know there are people who go through this passage and they kind of go down they cannot get their shit together and it's a time where if you you know if you're on the border of hey i might dive into alcohol or drugs i mean this can be a period where the despair and the, I mean, and there can be a certain hopelessness about this time because you really can't see a future. Nobody, nobody says to people when you're 60, like, hey, this could be in your future. You, you know, you could do this. You could write a book or you could do this, you know, but we consider those things to be anomalies. Right. For, old, for older people when in reality, you know, it could be a lifeline to staying vibrant. But, um... No, I think it's really... Yes, and then, I mean, then that, all these life-altering things hit you, and the instinct is you're going to go deeper into the unhealthy coping mechani mechanisms, and people have a really hard time getting out. So, and that, I felt, is too heavy, you know. But the reality is that it's... You know, I mean, the publishing industry, they, you know, they want, they want you to cut out the dark. Yeah. And you didn't. Lot. I mean, you didn't. But and yet it is also, I want to say, very funny. It's also I, yes. a really celebratory book about friendship and about love, which it also wouldn't be you if that wasn't a very strong element of it. You know, there's a lot about community and about gathering your, your circle together and bonding with each other through the hard times and the good times. That's all a very strong element of it as well. In with this, guess what, hunker down, because middle age is, mm -hmm. is kind of a, a storm. It's it, a shit storm. It is. It, you know, it, it really, it is. <laughs> and one of the things that I, f I found was, I, you know, it's easy to find yourself in a position, I mean, somehow when you're younger, stuff hits you, but you get through it and you have so much more to look forward to and strive to, it's not. Uh, but with this, it just feels like one thing after another, you know, from the big to the small. And, and, and but then on the other side, it feels like there really is I, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really, at this time, is you have to understand that there is loss, and it's about being able to deal with loss and move on and still be positive and still keep the sense of humor. Yeah, and still be able to write about, I, I'm going to ask you, because I can't let you go without ask, asking about, still being able to have a sense of humor talking about, like, vagina rejuvenation. Right. You, you talk about that. And you, what got me was that men give it to their wives for their birthdays, Candace. 
Yes. That is a weird gift. Okay. That is a weird it's, present to give a woman, uh, I'm going to say. It is. I'm a uh, woman. I, I, want, I don't want, I that, want, I don't want yeah. anyone to give that to me as okay. a gift. I want to tell you that I've also, in my life, had two men offer to buy me breast implants. Again, that's a weird gift. I'm just going to, I think that's a weird and gift. I said, and no. That, and that is a, that comes up in an episode of Sex in the City, where somebody does that. Yes, exactly. But, um. Not that I've memorized every episode, but I have. <laughs> <laughs> If you get me started, I'll probably be right there with you. Okay. Yeah. Um, but um, yes, it it is. And uh, but you know that probably goes back to this issue of you know the man is the one in control of all the money. Right. Right. And this is expensive. And this is important to that you acknowledge and that like what happens when you're a woman and your options do change. That you are on a different financial trajectory than a lot of your male peers, a lot of your male contemporaries. And yes. you certainly often come out of a marriage in a different place than a lot of your male peers, for sure. Oh yes, exactly. And and yet, and yet you keep getting up. And the book is still also about joy and laughter and friendship and silliness and ridiculousness and wildly expensive face creams. Yes. I want to ask you one more thing if I can. Of if course, right. you can ask so, me tons of stuff. Well, so as the quintessential New York woman, I'm, I'm sure, do you still ever think about, okay, so what would Carrie and the girls be like at this stage in life now, now in their 50s and into their 60s? Do you think that they would be struggling with these things or do you think that they would still just be out there drinking Cosmos and laughing? I mean, raising, well, I mean, some I of them are raising, would be raising teenagers by now, yes. right? Yes, I mean, I think one of the, I feel like, I mean, it feels like those characters, uh, you know, they're where they are. I, I have a hard time, even though the actresses are those ages, I have a hard time seeing those characters. I mean, I feel like the characters have, you know, there's so much a product now of like the, the TV series mm -hmm. and, and the movies that it's hard, I have a hard time like, they're so set, you know what right. I'm well, saying? It, nobody wants so to So I have know a hard time like picturing. What happens but, after uh, but I think, after Rochester and Jane settle down, right? We're kind exactly. of done with them. Is it like that? It's just like, okay, now we, we know. Yes, ex yes, I think, yes. Okay, it's now like Hamlet's that. dead on the floor. We're all just going to leave the theater. We don't <laughs> need to continue this, right? <laughs> Maybe it's more like that, right? It's, I think it is. Okay. Yes, it probably is. Uh, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel it. Like those characters feel so, like, they, there that I always, I always have a hard time, like, kind of extrapolating them out. But, I mean, the question that I get so much is... If Carrie Bradshaw were young today, you know, what would she be like? And the question I think that they're often asking is if she were in her 20s. And of course, you know, my Carrie Bradshaw never was in her 20s. She, you know, in Sex and the City, she was in her 30s. And for a very particular reason, because she was at that kind of crisis turning point where you've got to figure out what your life's about. And, but if there were a Carrie Bradshaw character in her 20s, she would definitely be all over Instagram. Um, She'd be an amazing influencer. And, you know, would be, I think, an influencer. And people always think, oh, would she be a writer? But I don't even think she would be a writer. I think that she would probably... Because writing doesn't pay. <laughs> you know, I mean, no she would probably be, you know, making videos on Instagram and, and you know, doing all that. Monetizing her, uh, um, her tutorials or you know, outfit of the I day mean, tutorials. Now, this is a question. Does anybody film their dates on Instagram? They must. I don't know. I, I mean, see, I that, feels like, now, that feels like something that could be interesting to do get I mean that would be the modern day sex in the city I think like some you know girls going on the dates filming it and putting it on Instagram Candace do we do we now have your next novel written halfway written I think we <laughs> okay then our mission today is accomplished Candace Bushnell thank you so much for joining us the book is called is there still sex in the city I'm not going to answer it you got to read the book to find out but there's definitely still sex out there for sure right Yes. Thank the answer you. is yes, 
but less. Yes, but. <laughs> Thank you, Candace. Thank you.